Welcome to December and episode 318 of the AMPM podcast. Today I'm speaking with Josh Hadley. Josh and his wife have created an amazing eight figure business based on her really creative and a unique style of design. And they've applied that to a whole multitude of products, got some great IP around it, and have some interesting ways of launching that product and building their list. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. I think you're going to get a lot of good value from this episode. So enjoy. Welcome to the AMPM podcast. Welcome to the AMPM podcast. We explore opportunities in e-commerce. We dream big and we discover what's working right now. Plus, plus, this is the podcast where money never sleeps. Working around the clock in the AM and the PM. Are you ready for today's episode? I said, I said are, are you, you ready? Ready. Let's do this. Let's do this. Here's your host, Here's your host Kevin King. Kevin King. Josh Hadley, welcome to the AM PM podcast. How are you doing, man? Hey, Kevin. Thanks for uh, having me on. I'm excited to be here today. Doing great. Now, you're just right up the road from me. I'm down in Austin, and you're up in Dallas. Actually, technically not Dallas. You have to say Dallas because no one's ever heard of the actual town that you, you're from. So if you say Dallas, they have an idea. But if you say yep. Flower Mound, they're like, what? There's a town named Flower Mound? Yep. Only, <laughs> only you would know where that is, Kevin, right? <laughs> that's right, because that's where I grew up. I actually grew up in Flower Mound. Um, and actually, you know, I was just back up there uh, a few weeks ago and my parents, uh, are moving from a house that they've been in for, I think it's 45 years that they've been in that wow. house and they were moving to some apartments that had just been built for seniors. Um, you know, not, not a nursing home, but like senior apartments. And I went up there to, uh, to help them. Uh, my dad was just like emphatic, like, I don't want anybody touching my computer because they'll screw it up. <laughs> you know, I want to make sure my computer works. When I move it from the house, so I told him, leave everything alone. Kevin, will you come up and move my computer? I'm like, yeah, no problem, Dad. I can come up. And it's a Mac. It's easy. But, you know, he doesn't know the difference between a USB cable and an Ethernet cable. So if you're on the phone with him, plug the cable in. They're like, which hole? Uh, so I'm like, <laughs> no problem. I'll come up there. But, yeah, Flower Mound is a little town uh, just north of Dallas, just north of the airport, actually, DFW Airport. Yep. And when I moved there 45 years ago, when they bought that house, I think I was in the third or fourth grade, something like that. Um, that town was maybe a thousand people and we were, we were a little neighborhood right on the edge of, uh, right on the way, almost to Louisville, uh, over off of Kirkpatrick road over Uh in in 1171, I think it was. And there was nothing out there. But now every time I go back, that place is just completely different. I'm like, I, I don't recognize it. Yeah, it has uh, grown a lot. A lot of good families around here, so we we enjoy being here for sure. Now you've you've been there just a, you came from Utah originally, right? You just been there for a, 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 hand, a handful of years. Came over, I think it was a uh, you're working for American Airlines, if I recall, uh, something yeah. like that. Yeah, that's correct. That's uh, was the journey. I am originally from Utah, and uh, graduated from the University of Utah with my MBA joined American Airlines in their MBA leadership development program. And I was actually there for five years, but it was during year number one uh, there at American Airlines that my wife and I started our business on the side. And then we just kept growing it on the side, yeah. working evenings a lot. And, but that's what originally brought us to, to Texas. And now man, before we, we get into, to get into the business stuff, we got to talk about American Airlines. We have another thing in common. My mom worked for American Airlines as well in the reservation department for, I don't know, 20 years. She was like a supervisor or something over there. Okay. And I remember uh, I, I had D1, uh, D2 passes. You remember? Yep. You, and, uh, oh, flying standby. Yep. Flying standby. And I remember, you know, um, this was a little before you were working on with them, but in the original days, it was a, a paper ticket. And you had this blank paper ticket that she would get these little booklets. And you would just show up at the airport and we always had to wear uh, our, our a coat and tie because you didn't know back. This was like in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. You didn't know if you were going to get bumped up to first class. And, as and long you as had they, to be dressed. You had to be right? dressed. You had to be dressed professionally if you if you could receive a first class ticket. Right? That's exactly right. It's like it was like the 19 flying in the 1950s or something back when everybody used to dress up to fly. But yeah, we'd show up at the airport and we would just ride in where we wanted to go. And as long as they had an open seat, you know, we were on the plane and. Sometimes, I remember one time we were on the plane, and we weren't sitting in first class, all happy that we wore our tie that day. 
And then some late people showed up and we got bumped off. It got pulled off the plane, <laughs> ended up like waiting seven hours or something for the next plane. But I used to use those D2 passes to fly all over the world. And the D2 oh, yeah. pass, for those of you that don't know, if you work for American, they're basically you just pay the, the airport fees and a, a small, like, yep. it's basically like 10% of, the, of the, the price of a ticket. And it just yep. comes out of the employee's check, but they can give them to friends, uh, they can give them to family members. Or they can give them to anybody, really. Uh, they get so, so many. Pr- D2s, I think, are unlimited. And D3s, I think there's a limited number, which the is like the next level pass. down. Yeah, yeah. Like, like a buddy pass. Yeah. And I used to fly. I'd show up and just go to Hawaii. Or I'd show up and just go to Paris or whatever. And it was it was freaking awesome. So did you get a chance when you were working there to actually use any of that stuff to travel? Yeah. So when we I did my internship with them between year one and year two of my MBA And so at that time, my wife and I had just barely gotten married, maybe I think it was three months prior to that. And so for us, like we had no obligations, not a whole lot going on at home. And so every single weekend we went somewhere new that summer. So, I mean, we went to Nashville, we went to San Francisco, we did a lot of domestic trips. Then we ended up, I think we went to, we did a couple international. We obviously went to Mexico. We ended up going to Korea. Um, That's where I served a a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So it was fun to go back there to those stomping grounds. So yeah, we used it a lot. There was one experience where we were standing by for a flight to go to Hawaii and we'd been working all summer long to try to like identify one weekend where there might be some open seats on a Hawaiian flight. And anyway, yeah, there's a special program they have, right? That, that special, as an employee, you can log in, you can see the load levels. You can see like, okay, this flight has 36 empty seats. It's probably a pretty good chance I'm going to make that flight. This one right. only has six, you know, or this one's oversold. So that's what you're talking about. So, so continue. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I just want to explain yeah. that to the audience. Yep. Yep. So we saw that it looked pretty good. Um, but then when we got to the ticket counter, I mean, it changes, as you know, on like an hourly basis, right? A flight gets delayed or something gets canceled. All of a sudden, people get rebooked onto the flight. Well, long story short, we're there at the ticket counter. We're waiting and there ends up being only one seat left on the plane. And it was like, well, are my wife and I, are we going to split up? And then the other person would have to wait until the next flight and then cross their fingers that they end up making it. But what was funny is like we turn around and the next gate, it was Cancun that was boarding. So we go over there, we had our passports and we're like, hey, do you have any open seats? They're like, oh yeah. In fact, we have first class open. So we flew to Cancun and that was an amazing experience itself. But that's like one of the experiences that unless you're working in the travel industry, you're not like, so I showed up at the airport planning to go to Hawaii and then five seconds later, I've changed my (laughs) mind and I'm boarding going to Cancun. And I've I've done the same thing. I mean, I've done the same thing of trying to get to Paris and I couldn't get to Paris uh, because flights were full and I was the heck with it. I'll just, uh, I can get on a flight to LHR, to London, to LHR and just uh, try to take the train over. You know, you get to creative because you're saving so much money and you're basically flying for free. And my yep. parents did the same thing like you did. They used to travel. Uh, they took heavy advantage of it for like 10 years. They would go somewhere every weekend or every other weekend almost uh, when, when they could. And they would just go to San Francisco for the lunch and come back. Uh, it's stuff, stuff like that, or just go somewhere for the weekend. Um, it's a great little perk, but the airlines now have tightened up and they've they yeah. got their load management so good now uh, with these algorithms, you know, that they, they, they fill these planes. So it's much more difficult to actually game it, uh, than it was, you know, 10 years ago. Oh, a hundred percent. And you're probably used to, I think for you, it was pretty rare to kind of get denied boarding for the most part. Right. I think you could basically go show up at the airport and basically guarantee, uh, you know, you'd be able to get on whatever flight you wanted to. But I know, you know, while I was working there, it got more and more difficult every single year as they tighten load factors and all of that stuff. Um, and as we started having kids, that's when it became not fun. It's one thing for my wife and I to be like, oh, we missed the flight. Bummer. All right, let's go plan something different or let's wait a couple hours for the next flight. As soon as you work kids into that equation, you've already packed for the kids, whatever weather, or, you know, heaven forbid you have to stay at the airport any longer with kids. It was like, eh, not so much fun anymore with the, 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 the free tickets because they were, it was hard having to like plan on that. You, you just never could plan on it. Right. That's right. And then that I, after I was, my mom quit working there, I didn't have access to those passes anymore. So I, 
but I was flying a lot. You know, I've been to, uh, to 92 countries, all seven continents. I've done a lot of flying and I, I became a uh, executive platinum on American, uh, for like, I had that for like seven years, which is uh, for those of you listening, this is their highest level. So you get system wide upgrades and automatic bumps to first class when seats are available. And you get, if the plane is delayed or canceled, you're at the top of the list uh, over everybody else that's out there. Um, you get earn extra miles, you get access to the really kick-ass lounges, like in the big airports that are really, really nice. Some of them have free massages in them. Some of them have, uh, uh, you know, like a really nice sit down meals and all kinds of stuff. And I had that for quite some time. And then I quit traveling for a couple years to focus more on business. And now there's a little hack out there. I just want to give people that may be listening. If you get an aviator MasterCard, it's an American Airlines MasterCard issued by Barclays Bank. You go to aviatormastercard.com. American Airlines just this year or in 2022, change the rules on how you can get executive platinum. It used to be you had to have your butt in the seat and fly 100,000 miles per year, butt in the seat, or you had to spend uh, quite a bit of money. Uh, to I, I forgot what the number was, but quite a bit of money to, to get that. Yep. Now, with this credit card tied to your Amazon business, if you use it for your, P, I use it for my PPC, I use it to buy inventory, I use it to buy pay for postage on, uh, you know, on one of my other businesses at stamps.com, use it for everything. And that card all the spend on that card not only earned you miles, but actually earned you status on American Airlines. And you can get, I got executive platinum status without flying a single flight earlier this year, like in March. I had it I, within the first two months, you have to spend, I, I forget what the number is exactly off the top of my head, but 150, 200, 200K. Two, it's 200K, yeah. So I yep. spent that by the first, by March, some point in March of this year from January. And I, I got, I got, so I have executive platinum status now, which actually, no matter what airline I'm flying on, whether it's American, anybody in the One World Alliance, which is like British Airways and Qatar Airways, you know, I'm going to the yep. World Cup semifinals and finals with my wife and we're flying Qatar Airways. I get all the elite status, all the elite check-ins, all the elite access to everything. Um, and it's, it's a great little hack out there that uh, if you're not taking advantage of that, it's probably one of the best things you can do. Yeah, Kevin, you weren't supposed to spill the beans on that because I, me, I was the same way. I signed up for that immediately because I was like, this is the biggest loophole ever. Like you don't have to travel at all and I'm going to get EP status overnight. And yeah, I, I, I essentially just put, put that credit card for all of our PPC spend. And then similar to you within two months, I'm at EP status and uh, have been enjoying those free upgrades. But now my, my question is, how many people start getting that EP status and now I'm battling with them, right? Because uh, it'll be interesting to see how American navigates this change. Yeah, there's there's a few little rules along with that. Uh, if you look at the fine prints, like some of the system wide upgrades don't kick in until you get like, I don't know the number off the top of my head, three or 400,000, you got to earn some more. Right. To, um, but yeah, it's going to make it a little bit more competitive. Uh, the people that understand uh, how, how that works. But speaking of competitive, you sell... On Amazon, would you have like something like 1,500 products or some crazy number of SKUs or something like that? Yeah, we have 1,300 SKUs on Amazon right now. Now, is that individual SKUs or is that like there's actually only 300 products and there's four variations of every product or what? Uh, what is that? Yeah, that's a good question. So the way we have it set up right now, all of those are individual like parent um, ASINs, right? So they're not just variations. Now, if you were to like kind of boil it down, we do have many of them you could consider variations because our unique, you know, spin on things is just product design. Uh, my wife's a fantastic graphic designer. I would argue one of the best in the entire world. And she's so good at like creating product designs that we can come out with a new product with a new design on it. And we don't necessarily cannibalize any of our existing sales for the other products. But we're able to show up like, well, you look for, you know, one of our search terms and you'll see probably 10 or 15 of our listings occupying all over that first page. Whereas if we made them parent child relationships, you only got one ASIN that shows up, you know, on page one for that search term. So, so even though someone might be similar, you're that, that's, a, that's a question a lot of people always ask their son on Amazon that should I do parent child or put, make them as individual parents. And you're the, the school of thought of make them individual. So you take up more real estate and own more of the spots. Yeah. And one of the things that uh, my team and I are just recently testing, I don't have like conclusive data yet, 
But what we're experimenting with, because yeah, that's been the age old debate. And I've asked that question numerous times to people like Brandon Young and even yourself, like experienced sellers and like, Hey, how do you guys approach it? A lot of people do tie them into variations, but what we are going to do is our approach is, Hey, let's launch a lot of designs up front and then let's see what sticks right? Let's see, you know, what's funny is like, I'm typically proven wrong, whatever I think. If I love a particular design, I'm like, I think this one will crush it. It ends up being like the worst performing one. Um, that's why I don't do the design work, I guess. Right. But, uh, anyways, what we plan to do is at the end of that honeymoon period, let's say it's 90 days, right? After the first 90 days that this product has been launched, we see which of those ASINs have stuck on the first page and they've gotten ranking on the first page, they're doing well. Then what we'll do is we'll take those loser ASINs, so to speak, you know, that haven't gotten good ranking. And then we will make those like parent child relationships to the top selling ASINs so that it gets that, you know, let's say the flywheel effect there of, all right, well now it shows, you know, maybe a few extra options that can increase the conversion rate for some of our best sellers and then kind of feeding extra traffic from, you know, some of the long tail keywords that those loser ASINs were actually getting ranked for, right? Those will still show up there, but now we're kind of feeding traffic into. So, so if an ASIN gets to page one, that's a winner ASIN. It keeps it stays as a parent, standalone parent. But yep. if something you launch something and it's just uh, trickling, uh, and it just for whatever reason just is not as popular or just can't it's more competitive, it can't get ranked and it's sitting on page two, three, four, something, then you'll combine that to with one of the ones on, on page one to give it a little boost. Correct. Yep. So I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, the hypothesis is true is that it would create that flywheel effect, right? Where, oh, great. Now we're generating even more sales. Amazon continues to give it a lot of organic ranking love, so to speak, when we do that. Uh, but if the reverse starts to happen and it decreases conversion rate and we start losing organic ranking on that first page for the winning ASIN, then obviously we would undo that parent-child relationship. So we just started that test literally, I think, two weeks ago. So we're waiting to to see if it follows that hypothesis. hypothesis. So Kevin, we'll have to do another episode uh, and uh, we'll have bring to. people up to speed. That's right. So when you say design, what does that mean? Does that mean the design of a product, like creating some new product? Does that mean like some sort of artwork or graphic design that's on the product? What, do, what yeah. does design mean? Yeah, most of it's like artwork on the actual product itself. And so that's the the unique aspect to our businesses. Uh, I think one of the best competitors I think we could kind of relate to would be Rifle Paper Co., who is actually doing a horrendous job on Amazon, by the way. Um, somebody needs to go in there and focus on that. But uh, they do a good job of like their their whole distribution model is wholesale, right? And you'll find them in a lot of boutique stores. But essentially what they do is they take any product and even products that you wouldn't even think needed a design put on them, such as they just had, um, they just came out with a line of wallpaper. They just came out with like a line of shoes. Um, obviously they do journals and things like that, um, but they just put their design on top of it. And so we don't have the kind of the same vibe that that Rifle Paper Co. has. We have a different kind of like niche. And my wife, I would say like gears much more towards like children's oriented products and things like that. Whereas Rifle Paper Co. much more like floral, you know, women oriented products. So are you focusing mostly on paper products? Like is this yeah. like planners and design and books and uh, art posters and artwork, things like that? Or is it taking, like you said, shoes and putting some sort of cool design and selling the shoes or what, what is the, the main type of product you're putting this stuff on? Yeah. So we, the way the business originally started is that we were designing, we were custom designing wedding invitations for people. Right. So my wife, you know, was a great graphic designer. Friends of hers would come to her. Hey, can you design a wedding invitation? Well, that, that worked for two years. And then we just got so busy to where it was like, hey, this is not scalable, especially if we want to have a family. Uh, you're just soaking all of your time into meeting with these brides and their moms. You know, working with brides always a fun, <laughs> fun thing to navigate. But anyways, we one of the first products that we came out with were like just kind of like generic party invitations. We're like, hey, these could be like generic, like literally fill in the blank style invitations. And I was like, is this even a thing on Amazon, right? 
And, uh, you know, sure enough, like we did generate some sales. And then from there, like my mind, like opened up to like, oh, wow, like what other stationary related products could we get into? So that's how we started amassing a lot of different products. And then we got into stickers. Um, we've got into magnets recently. Um, COVID happened. And obviously that was not a friendly event for the event space. And that's primarily like, if you would have talked to me pre COVID would have been like, Oh yeah, we do a lot of like event, um, stationary, right? Like that would be like our brand that I would tell you about. And then COVID literally overnight, like decimated that business. And what's interesting is I've talked to a lot of other sellers that were in the same space, like literally overnight, we went down 90% in our sales overnight. And it was like, Oh my goodness. Like, we've built this thing up over the last four years just to like watch it all like crumble over the next little bit. Um, fortunately, like it took two or three months for sales to start coming back, not by any means close to where they were prior to that, but at least, you know, gave us a little bit of life and hope and we're able to navigate that. But that's when we started like pivoting more into like, all right, now let's do magnets. Okay. Let's do some stickers. And so now as we look to the future, we are looking at, you know, that, that competitor that I mentioned, Rifle Paper Co. Um, it's going to be all about like, how do we go acquire other brands or businesses that already have established relationships with manufacturers of those types of products, right? Could be shoes, I think is a, is a more challenging one. We probably won't do that one very soon. But getting into like tumblers, right, is an easy one getting into uh, you know the the pencil carrying bags or backpacks that's kind of the next phase of where we see Hadley designs we see ourselves being in let's say an aggregator of design based product brands so why and do so this why do all this yourself why not actually if your wife is uh, the like you said she's a really talented designer why don't she create the designs copyright and then license it out and let other people and really expand it out so you don't have to cash flow it that you where you can just say look this is an amazing design go find someone that makes tumblers license it to them and take a seven percent ten percent royalty and then go find someone that does shoes and someone that find, does a uh, stationery and someone that does playing cards and someone that does scrapbooking album stickers or whatever and just license it instead of you having to foot the bill and manage 1300 1500 SKUs. Why, if, why not it, you just cherry pick the ones that are the best for you, the cash flow wise and the easiest to manage and instead of managing 1300 SKUs and having, I don't know how many employees you have to, to mess with that. I'm, I'm yep. guessing it's a, it's a few, it's a, it's more than one. Yeah. And then license that and, and build, build an IP empire uh, and let everybody else that's already in the business do it that already has the distribution, not just Amazon, because you guys, you know what you're doing on Amazon. I think you're doing eight figures plus on Amazon. So you know what you're doing there. But these people that already have all this distribution out there, has that thought come come through? Yeah, I, I think there definitely is a play there. And your, your point is very valid, right? Um, and I think especially as we try to navigate cash flow as we continue to grow, I'd say the reason we haven't been as aggressive in pursuing that strategy of licensing artwork well, is number one, margin, right? Is because, well, we know we could get a, a healthy margin. We could do this ourselves, right? We know the game on Amazon. Now that's much easier said than done, right? Because now I've got cash flow, I've got overhead with employees and team building and all of that stuff. That That is a lot of work in and of itself for sure. I think it's because Becca and I, my wife, have a very clear vision of where we want to go um, with our brand. What we're eyeing for is a strategic exit um, in the future. And our ideal you know, kind of acquirer, so to speak, is going to be a Hallmark brand, right? Or is going to be Papyrus. But, but will they? Because, because your wife is the brand. Yeah. The brand uh, without your wife, if there's not, who else is creating this artwork? Your wife is the talented, super talented designer. And Correct. to sell that, you could sell your existing inventory, your existing channels. But without her, that's like saying, uh, you know, the guy that created peanuts, you know, someone's going to buy peanuts and somebody else is going to draw it and create yep. it. Uh, it's just not going to be the same. It's, it's Apple without Steve Jobs. It's just not the same. Uh, so yep. how, how would you handle... How are you seeing that happening where you're just as a strategic exit without your wife? Yeah, 
I think obviously there's going to be a component that my wife is involved in that, right? I think one of the things that they're going to want is her design ability, right? And my wife just loves to design, right? And I think the reason why a strategic exit, you know, sounds interesting to us in the future. Now, again, you know, I'm talking, I'm projecting here five years in the future, not knowing what, you know, any type of working relationship would look like with some of those brands. But obviously there's going to be a component where they're going to want Becca to continue to design products for them. I think what interests Becca in that is that, hey, you know, we no longer have to worry about the business side of it, so to speak. Here's a bunch of different products that you get to design. And maybe some of these are products that you've never had the chance to design in the past. And then being able to have more of an established footprint, you know, for example, Hallmark, they're, they're everywhere, right? They're in a lot of retail stores. So like just being able to see our products and even some of her designs that she does, whether it's for that new brand or not, just coming to fruition and seeing that, that's kind of been, that's the ultimate vision. Like that's my wife's goal is like, I want to walk into Target and I want to see my stuff all over the place, right? Um, I want to walk in and, you know, whether it's greeting cards or party invitations, you know, there's a whole dedicated space to that in Target. So that's kind of the the long-term vision for us. So you're not doing any of that now. Right now it's, you're pr- I, I, you probably have your own website, but I'm assuming uh, it's primarily Amazon focused right now. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. We've doubled down on Amazon, right? Because we've seen, you know, our best return is just launching new products, new product after new product after new product. And IP has been very important to us. We work closely with Rich Goldstein, um, who I know we, we have a mutual connection there. And Rich has helped us. We have, you know, when all is said and done, by this time next year, we should have over 100 different design patents. Not only has that been helpful in being able to uh, kick off people that just, they take a look at our design and they get inspired by our design, so to speak, especially a lot of the overseas competitors. Um, they'll literally mimic our design and we'll not, you know, first of all, we have copyrights for all of our products. So we're able to issue, you know, those copyright infringements and those have been successful in getting people booted off pretty quickly. But then the design pads kind of like your silver bullet, right? You're, if you can get somebody down with, because of a patent, like there's no way for them to get back on Unless they take you to court, it has to be resolved through court, right? And then have to provide legal documents to Amazon to say, hey, no, this ASIN, you know, you know, it, the court has decided that this is not infringing this design patent. That's a lot. That's a big, tall task. So like design patents are our kind of bread and butter right now. And so, you know, that's why we, we kind of welcome the competition. It's like, all right, yeah, go be inspired by our design. And then Rich does such a good job creating those design patents. You know, we can go take down other people that try to replicate or, you know, create designs inspired by our designs. Um, You know, just because my wife's so creative, you know, I'd love to say I'm amazing guru and have been able to get stuff ranked uh, amazingly well. And we do do a good job. We understand the ranking algorithm. But at the end of the day, like my wife's products just speak for themselves. So when you, that must be hundreds of thousands of dollars in design patent stuff. And we do. And yeah, well with Rich, we, we've worked out an agreement. He's, he's given us a a good deal. Um, we'll say that, but yeah, Jen, you'd be looking at, I mean, we've spent well over six figures in, in IP for sure. And why, why a lot of people, they skimp out on that. They just, that's just not something they're willing to spend money for. It scares them. Why is that so important for for sellers, and at what point should they actually be considering that? If, if what if they go spend all this money and design, the, or the the idea just doesn't fly? Should they wait till a certain point, or what's your philosophy on on, on that? Yeah, that's a great question because it's been something that we've had to navigate um, over the last few years. So prior, it, we really started you know getting into the design pants and the copyrights about two years ago, and so what we saw happening is that, again, we would launch a product and then it would be a few months later, some overseas competitors or even US competitors would start to just literally replicate our designs. And it's like, guys, like <laughs> that's not cool business. Uh, that's so non-creative, right? And it was very frustrating. It's like, how do we do this? Like, 
honestly, you know, I was I was inexperienced and also kind of hesitant back then to say, hey, let's let's how do we how do we bring these people down or like get them kicked off or whatever, right? Because I know as an Amazon seller, you're always worried about suspensions, especially back in the day, right? I'm not as worried about suspensions now, but like back in the day, it was like you could wake up the next morning and your account's gone, right? And so that was always like the fear in the back of people's minds. And I was like, well, I don't want to like be the one that does that to somebody, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, I met Rich Goldstein at uh, a War Room Mastermind event and, um, got to talking to him, sharing with him the different products that we have. And I was like, here's our challenge of why we've never pursued IP is because with thousands of products, like we're, co- we're coming out with like 30 to 40 new products um, every single month, right? And so a typical design patent is going to cost you at least five grand, right? So imagine spending five grand on 40 different SKUs every single month, like, that's just not realistic, right? You're not going to make that money back that quick. Um, so the approach that we've started taking is the very first thing that we do, as soon as we've got the product design finalized, even before we start printing it, we go and get the copyrights done. And those copyrights will come back you know, uh, within about three to six months, six months at the latest typically, um, but typically three months. And so that copyright is live as soon as we're kind of going live with our product as and well. That's only like $65 or something like that, right? Yeah. And then we pay Rich to, to do, you know, some of that, the upfront work. But yes, yeah, filing the copyright with the, the government is like, I think we pay 85 bucks because we have them like multiple sheets in there. But yeah, it's relatively cheap for that, right? But we pay the legal fees to have Rich, you know, write it up correctly. Yeah. And, and they all go through and, and that's been good. So then what we do is we wait another six to nine months, right? Because with the design patent, you only have a year to file for um, protection for that. Like as soon as a year and one day has passed, it, since it's been publicly disclosed, like, sorry, you're, you're out of luck. You can no longer um, apply for protection with a design patent or a utility patent for a product, right? So... At six months to nine months, obviously, we've launched the product. We're already generating sales from it. We know which ASINs are winning. And so, again, we the ones that are loser ASINs, right, or just never get the traction that we had hoped for, we don't apply for design patents on those. The ones that are winning, we can move forward. And we, you know, with Rich, we kind of have a, like just a bundle package that he's created custom for us. And it's just an experiment for him, honestly. He's like... I've never done, you know, hundreds to even a thousand different, you know, uh, copyrights plus design pants on products, but I'm willing to pursue this journey with you. And so I appreciate Rich, you know, it's been, it's been a dance for us, but it's been fun. And then, you know, those 69 months pass, we d- filed design pants for the winning ASINs so that that way, at least like from a business decision, like it's making sense financially and then you know it, you still have to wait another 12 to 18 months for that to even come through um, and come to fruition. But that's the process that we use. And again, I would encourage, especially even new sellers, like in the least bit, I would at least go and get copyrights. I wish we would have done that up front. And then with your copyrights, if you can prove to Amazon, and it's very clear, like you can, I love that Amazon has like, here's the launch date, basically when this listing was started. If you can prove to Amazon and show them like, here's when our product was launched, here's our product design, and here's our copyright number. And by the way, here is a list of competitors. You can see they've all launched after us and they've all kind of either replicated, mimicked, or they've been inspired by our design and they might have changed one or two pieces of artwork. But it's uh, besides that, it's all about the same. We go and we file, you know, takedown notices for those. And we have literally, like, I think it's a 95% sex success rate thus far by initiating those. And we're just trying to tell people like, hey, we want you to go compete, but be original with your ideas. Like, don't just copy us. So I think anybody in like the design space, like go get your copyrights first and foremost, and then go like, go protect them. A copyright can also protect your listing. And a lot of people complain about people copying their bullet points. You can actually copyright your listing on Amazon too. Uh, and yes. actually 
go after people for copying for copying. And you can, you know, you can use an attorney like uh, Josh is doing. And I, I recommend that if you're at that level, but if you're brand new, you could file your own copyrights and at least get that basic protection. If, if you're just on a shoestring budget, you can do it directly with copyright.gov and have, have some ammunition uh, that you can go after people, uh, hijackers and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and people that are just copying your bullet points, copying your listing, copying your images. You know, I, I had that problem before where I had people, I, had a, uh, I have an ab roller and we, we did a big expensive photo shoot and people would with, with models and they would take our pictures with, with our models and just Photoshop in their ab roller in place of ours and mm. use those pictures. And we were able to get them all. Not, we copyrighted the pictures. Uh, I mean, technically in the U.S., they're copyrighted the moment they're created. But you need for, for legal purposes, you need that document. And so we copyrighted them and went after them all and uh, got them all taken down. Uh, and we were having problems with our Chinese suppliers using them over on 16. Uh, 86 and uh, all those other websites over there uh, and Alibaba and we got them all taken down everywhere. Uh, so oh, did you really? Yeah. You even got them down on the Chinese site. Yeah, so that's we even got them down on the Chinese. I mean, but some of those we it was our our manufacturer that was doing it and we caught them. Uh, <laughs> of so course. They, they they wanted our our business. So, I mean, I'm sure some of them slipped through, but the vast majority got taken down. So is your wife on the artwork that she's creating, is she, is she a pencil and paper and creating and scanning in, or is she a digital artist using like illustrator and creating these designs? What's, what type of uh, artist is she um, specifically? Yeah, uh, she does a, a little bit of both, um, but more on the digital side. So she's really good. I mean, she has a tablet. I'm looking at it over here. She has a tablet that she can like draw on that connects to, you know, Adobe Illustrator. So like when she needs to draw flowers or a pumpkin or whatever it is, she can do that by hand, but that she's also like extremely talented when it comes to just utilizing Adobe Illustrator. In fact, you can go find her on TikTok. She does like uh, d graphic design tutorials. She has like 100K followers there, uh, but you can follow her. It's Becca underscore A underscore Hadley if you're interested for all of our graphic design fans. And ha Hadley is H-A-D-L-E-Y. Uh, yep. So that, that's another question. So if she's got 100,000 followers on TikTok where she's she's not actually really pushing her products, but she's pushing her, her methodology and teaching people, I would think you'd be able to leverage that in a very nice, coy way to actually get those people to then buy products when you launch a new product. Yeah. Are, you, are you doing any of that? So we had just, uh, let's say it was three weeks ago. So my wife, let's say she started on TikTok about, I want to say a year ago. Um, and she's built up a, a fan base pretty quick, obviously. And we just, again, about a month ago or so, put in a survey form there that's the only link on her bio. It's like, hey, come, you know, like tell us why you're following her, Becca, uh, what it is that you're interested in. Hey, you know, we, we have some fun surprises and we'll, we'll do some giveaways in the future. Enter your email address and your phone number. Um, and that, well, we don't even ask for their phone number in that. We ask for their email address and then we tell them to text us and we give them a, a, you are a short, you know, code or whatever to text our, our text code that we have that we have on our product packaging as well. And uh, anyway, so that way they're going into our text list as well. And so, yes, we're, we're building that. So we haven't necessarily directly reached out to Becca's followers quite yet to say, let's, what does this look like if we run a promotion to them? But yeah, that's part of our plans that we're doing annual planning here in a couple of weeks for 2023 and focusing on like monetizing our list because we have a large list. I think we have 30,000 people just on our text list alone. How was um, that? How was that generated? From product inserts. So like QR codes on product inserts and what, what are you doing to get motivate them to actually get onto this list or give up their phone number? Yeah. So we have a, on the back of um, each of our products. So we have like our product label right at the front of the product. And then behind it printed on the back sheet of that is, you know, Hey, thanks so much for your purchase. You know, it's a little bio, like this is a family run business. It's a picture of our family. And then we say, Hey, text us within the next 24 hours. It says like, Hey, congratulations. You qualify for a free gift. Text us within the next 40, 24 hours, um, for a free gift. And we leave it kind of open-ended. 
And I think, you know, you were on my podcast uh, just a couple weeks ago, Kevin, and I got a lot of great ideas from you that I, I have in my mind of ways that we can refine ours and make it even better. But um, that's what we're currently doing. It's just this open-ended, like, what is this free gift? And yeah, it's just a QR code. As, some, as soon as somebody scans it, and we, we specifically say on that product packaging that, um, hey, like join our text list. And then we have like our little disclaimer there that you have to for, you know, text message marketing and all that. Um, so anyways, they scan the QR code. It automatically pulls up their, you know, uh, their message there. And then they just have to hit the send button. And then we have a whole flow that it walks them through. And so I think we even have a sequence that goes out. Um, I think it goes out for 90 days, like a sequence where we start like introducing them to other products that we sell. And then we, we send what's cool about we're using simple texting and with simple texting, I think it's, I've tried looking at like attentive and some of these other bigger ones. One thing that they lack is like being able to schedule messages, like based on certain events. And so what I have scheduled is people enter their birthday as like a free, like, Hey, enter your birthday for a free birthday gift. So every year they get sent, Hey, happy, a happy birthday message from us. And then they get, you know, a little promo code to go buy whatever from our shop and various promotions. And then we do like an annual, like from the day that they've joined our list, we do like an anniversary uh, message that we send to them. That's like, Hey, congratulations. It's been, it's your one year anniversary since you were first, uh, you know, a new subscriber of Hadley design. So here's a promo code. And so that just, that's on repeat for everybody. And you, are you using this list to launch the next, uh, these 30, 40 products or whatever a month, or that would seem like you're hitting them quite a bit, or I mean, that would be a lot of, uh, marketing and over overwhelming and spammy yeah. almost, or how are you launching yep. these, these new products? So they only get right now, they only get one text per month. Okay. So the, and this is more of like our give, right? Look at Gary V jab, jab, right hook, right? So our jab where we are essentially giving them value is at the beginning of each month, we give them a free digital wallpaper, right? It's, Hey, download this month's digital wallpaper. It's something that Becca's designed that meets the theme, the season, right? So like this month, it's like a pumpkin themed, wallpaper or something like that, right? So they get that at the beginning of each month. And then we'll, one of the things that we do is like maybe once or twice a month, we will ask them for feedback. So instead of going to PicFu, yeah, I don't know why that slipped my mind. We use it so often. Instead of going to PicFu, we'll go to our list and say, hey, out of these product designs or out of these first images, which one do you like best? And then what's interesting is that we will have people that say, oh, that's amazing. I would really love a new calendar, right? Oh, this is a this would be an amazing calendar design. And so we have as part of that that says, hey, give us your feedback. And then if this is something you're interested in, join this other kind of like list. We say, hey, reply back with the word calendar if this is something that you'd be interested in uh, being notified when we launch it. So then we're not broadcasting out when we do launch calendars or whatever for each year. We're not broadcasting that out to all 30,000. We're broadcasting it to the people that have already raised their hands. And so we're not pissing off people, uh, but they're actually more engaged that way. So that's kind of like the flows that we've been working through. But still, that's like 360, 400, 500 products a year. That's still a lot. That's a that's a major management. Do you have special software that you've created or is it VAs or that's a lot to manage that whole, that yeah. many products with that many systems. Who wants the calendar? Who wants this one? Who wants that one? Um, and then when that comes out to actually say, hey, there's 200 people on this list that want this calendar, go. it's available now, go buy it, which, ins- which launches you. And if they do yep. that, are you using any special URLs or you use just straight link? Uh, go yeah. search, find buy. What, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. All great questions. Lots to unpack there. Um, so we just have it real right now. It's just my executive assistant that helps me coordinate some of those messages. Now, let's not mistake like, you know, we launch 40 new SKUs a, a month. We're not doing we're not peppering all 40 of those SKUs into the messages per month, like per month, like 
we're very selective. And typically what we do is we'll say, hey, this this particular product seems like it should have mass appeal, right? Kind of like calendars, like, oh, everybody could use a calendar, right? Whereas if we do something like, hey, we're, we are doing virtual party invitation, like virtual baby shower invitations, for example, right? It's like, well, the number of people that need a virtual party, like uh, baby shower invitation is a very like unique subset, right? You could find them on Amazon, but like of our 30,000, like you'd be lucky if there's maybe one or two of those, right? Mm-hmm. So it's those instances where we, we have to distinguish and that typically comes from myself that's like, hey, yeah, this this is a good product with a lot of mass appeal. So let's follow the sequence where we invite people to kind of like join us in this product design experience, right? And giving their feedback. In terms of management, the way that we have it set up is that as soon as somebody texts back a keyword, simple texting automatically adds them to that list. And so it's not like we have to have somebody manually going through and like, oh, move this one person over here. Like everything just gets sorted automatically based on people texting the correct keywords and then it just moves them to different lists there. And then I have a copywriter that will create some, you know, copy messages that uh, we'll schedule on those. But it's relatively simple, uh, uh, not overly complex. And the link that we give them, we just give them our... Uh, the brand referral link, right? So just the attribution link and it's going directly to our store landing page. So that way, again, because we'll come out with like, let's say 20 new designs for a calendar or something like that, instead of, you know, taking them to what we think is the best design, we just say, Hey, here's, here's all of our calendars, you know, browse through, pick which one you like best. Um, so that's what we've been doing. We've never done any of the, um, rebate stuff. So that wasn't a big change. Really, it's just PPC. And then sending to our list is is the way that we've always launched. We have never, um, other than when we first, first, first got started, that was back in the day where you could give out free products and you could, you know, get reviews and stuff. We did that very briefly, but I think like it was like literally three months after we launched, Amazon changed their TOS for that. So that was the only time where we were like giving away products so how do you do it on a PPC basis? Like if, so your, des, your design is your distinguishing factors, your USP. Yep. So if I'm targeting um, I don't know, baby shower invitations, let's just say you have baby shower, yep. a, a cool design for baby shower invitations. Are, and so are you just targeting baby shower invitations? The, uh, and then you're hoping that your, your design stands out among everybody else and looks the coolest and what people want? Or are you doing something based around her name? Or are you doing something niche down a little bit further? Baby's design, I mean, baby shower invitations with flowers because your yep. design has flowers? Or how are you doing that? Yeah, so PPC has been something that we've been working on a lot over the past year. And like, how do we really focus on getting good performance? Because it, initially it was just kind of like we just threw a bunch at the wall and just saw what stuck and we'd get bad performance and we'd just kind of live with it. Um, we're a lot smarter now. And I, I think this has been a good launch strategy for ourselves. So what we'll do is we will first look at all the keywords like, and we will um, get the keywords where our competitors that we're launching against, where they're ranking, right? And then what I have my team do that I think is unique is we cat- we categorize our keywords into four different categories. Shop, a semi-shop keyword, a browse-specific keyword, and then a browse keyword. So what's the difference between those? A shop keyword means that the product that and the type of design that we came out with, we are seeing other competitors ranked in the top, like let's say top 10 search results for that particular keyword. Then a semi-shop keyword will mean, yeah, our competitors are on the first page, but they're not at the top right? Browse specific is, hey, yeah, it looks like a couple competitors are getting onto page number one, but it's not all of our competitors that we're targeting. And then more of like the browse keyword, this would be something like baby shower ideas, right? It's like, okay, that's a super browse keyword. Maybe one of our competitors has stumbled onto that first page, but it's a rarity, right? 
like this is like you're you're kind of shooting for the moon. Obviously, there's more search volume for those. So where do we start? We start specifically just with the the shop keywords to begin with. And so what we'll do is we'll take, let's say we come out with 10 new SKUs for those invitations. Um, what we'll do is we'll put, we find all of those keywords that we deem being shop keywords. And then we will associate all of those 10 SKUs to each of those keywords. Unless, like you mentioned, there's a keyword that specifically references, and typically these are your longer tail keywords, like a specific design. So baby shower invitations with flowers, right? Well, in that case, we only take any SKUs, if any, that have flowers on them, right? And then it's promoting just that one or two ASINs for that particular keyword. And then we're creating exact match campaigns. So this is like, hey, Amazon, either take it or leave it. Like, we're not doing phrase, we're not doing broad or auto here. Like, take it or leave it. This is the exact match keyword that we want to target for each of these products. And we've had a lot better success with that. To begin with, we've already done so much keyword research. I think in the past, so many people would say, hey, start with a broad campaign, start with an auto campaign see what's working, then move that over into an an exact campaign. Once you see what's working, it's like, well, to be honest with you, like we've done so much keyword research and like we have, I have a whole team that's just dedicated to doing in-depth keyword research that uh, when we launch, like I already know the keywords that we should be winning on. And if they aren't performing well, then we've had, we have some concerns for the product in general And so we're able to launch out of the gate with exact match campaigns. I feel like we get ranked a lot faster and better that way because we're targeting shop keywords, which means our conversion rate is also going to be higher than if we just turn on an auto campaign and it's kind of a mixed bag, as everybody knows. So that's kind of been our approach. Does that answer that question? I think that's good. And why not any merch? Are you doing any merch? I mean, her designs are popular. Putting, why don't you let Amazon throw them on T-shirts and stuff that in the merch program? Yeah, we do have a merch by Amazon okay. uh, division that we do do. My wife doesn't spend a whole lot of time on that, um, but we are like we stay very current on all of that. So we do have a couple designers that do work for us that create more designs for merch because we want to stay attuned to what merch can potentially grow into. And so, yeah, we're doing, you know, six plus figures on merch in and of itself. So it is an extra revenue stream that we enjoy. Now, speaking of extra revenue streams, this is probably an extra time stream instead of an extra revenue stream. You recently launched a podcast. Um, so what, what is, and I think you're in partnership with rise 25 or something. Um, they, or they have some aspect cause I, I know I was on your podcast in October and uh, I had a great time, uh, and I got a little email from like Rise 25 in conjunction with you, which for those of you who don't know, well, you tell them what Rise 25 is and tell them about the podcast as well. Yeah, yeah. So I recently launched a podcast just this month in October, and uh, it's called Ecom Breakthrough. That's Ecom with two M's, and uh, it's available on all the typical podcasting channels. But yeah, uh, Rich Goldstein, again, the name comes up here. He recommended me. I was telling him at another mastermind event that I was at, I was like, hey, I've always been wanting to uh, create a podcast just because I wanted to start rubbing shoulders with other sellers who are doing amazing things, learning from them, but also you know, with our vision of being a, you know, an aggregator for design-based product brands. Obviously, I need to you know, establish more of a network and see what some of the best people are doing and, and then return the favor, uh, for other sellers that like myself, when I started, you know, back what, seven years ago, uh, with our business, I wish I would have had a mentor to kind of help guide me along the way. And so the podcast is sharing a lot of the failures that I've made in the business following our journey and then interviewing, you know, really, you know, I think experts in the space, such as you, Kevin, that's why you were one of uh, the first guests on there. And Roland Frazier, we'll have Brandon Young, Bradley Sutton, we've had Stephen Pope on. And the intention for this podcast is for businesses that have got to seven figures, right? And I think 
my wife and I, we got to seven figures on Amazon in our first year. It was just me and her and, and another assistant, right? And I hear that time and time again, where a lot of people can br- build established businesses really quick, but then the challenge is like, wait, now how do I turn this into a real business and go from seven to eight figures and beyond? And so that's the intention of this podcast is interviewing experienced um, sellers and people in the e-commerce space and sharing actionable strategies to help you grow and overcome the plateaus and the challenges that you'll face moving from seven to eight figures and beyond. And so Rise 25 um, is kind of the agency that I'm working with that has helped me kind of like formulate this this strategy. And they've done such a good job, like just the mindset shift of like how I approach the podcast. What's interesting is like the very first call I, I jumped on with Jeremy, he's one of the co-owners there. Um, he's like, now tell me, why do you want to launch this podcast? And I was like, oh, well, I think it would be fun. I think it would be nice to interview people and get to know them. And like, he's like, you have to have a better reason than that. Because if you don't, what we see is after 20 episodes, people just give up. And he's like, we will not work with you unless you have a better plan as to like, what is the meaning behind this podcast? And I love that. Like he, he invited me to kind of like do a little more pondering in terms of like, what is the purpose of this? Is this just like a pet project? If so, like, you know, your hobbies will change over time and he'll just be like, Oh, that's too much work. I'm out because it is a lot of work as you know, Kevin. And, um, really it came down to like the ultimate vision for the brand and getting ourselves out there. And I think for me, like one thing that drives me is giving back, um, just to the entire e-commerce, um, industry, because I know when I was in college, I received a scholarship. I could have, you know, uh, worked my way through school and, and paid for school, but instead I was very fortunate to be a recipient from a very generous donor who had an impact on my life that changed it forever. He and literally paid for my entire schooling and it allowed me to to really double down in college. I got involved in the Utah Entrepreneur Series there, which is a series of competitions for all collegiate students throughout the state of Utah and I ran their entire competition um, there for 2 years. And being able to do that and get real life practical experience rubbing shoulders with entrepreneurs I wouldn't have experienced that um, had I had to be going to school, coming home, working, and and trying to make ends meet that way. And so anyways, that's a big passion of mine is like just giving back to people. And I believe that what goes around comes around for sure. And then in in the future, hopefully we're able to exit our brand and we've been able to acquire other brands along the way. So that's the intention of of all of this. Well, we've been going here for a while. I think uh, we could probably keep going for another hour or two. Uh, but uh, I want to say thanks, uh, Josh, for coming on and uh, and sharing this, some some great insight and some great information. And we'll have to do this again because I know there's a lot more we could dive into uh, and, and talk about that I think would be of uh, a benefit to the audience. But yeah, I appreciate, we'll- your, appreciate your time today. And be sure to go out and check out my episode on on his podcast. What what Give him the name again of how to find that. So it's Ecom Breakthrough. So Ecom with two M's. And uh, Kevin's podcast just came out on October 25th of 2022. So you can go search that up by the by the date. And it starts with the, the title episode is Kevin King's uh, Wicked Smart, you know, and blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> I appreciate it, Josh. Well, it's great seeing you again, and uh, I'm sure I'll be seeing you uh, again, hopefully uh, maybe at a, a scalable event or maybe at uh, the next Billion Dollar Seller Summit or, or who knows where. But uh, uh, take it easy, man. And thanks again for your time. Planning on it. Thanks again, Kevin. Josh and I could have kept talking for quite some time there, but I think you got a lot of great little nuggets and little words of wisdom out of that podcast. I hope you really enjoyed it. I know I did speaking with Josh and don't forget to check out his podcast that he just launched, Ecom Breakthrough, ecombreakthrough.com. I was featured back in October on one of the episodes. You can check that one out. I shared a few cool things that I've done with some of my businesses on that episode. So go and check that out. And also, you can check out Josh's episode on Serious Sellers podcast. Bradley interviewed him back in October. So if you go back and look at the October episodes of the Serious Sellers podcast, 
You'll be able to catch a whole different podcast where he talks about a lot of different stuff, completely different than what we just talked about on the Serious Sellers podcast. I hope to see you again next week. I hope quarter four is off to a good start for you and sales are really picking up. And just before I leave, I'd like to leave you with this week's words of wisdom. Remember, life is not a dress rehearsal, so live it to the fullest. Life is not a dress rehearsal. Live it to the fullest. See you again next week. <laughs>